The opening sequence of episode 10 is a bit of an interesting case as it's almost directly completed by the title of the episode. As we've heard many many times before, Armin retells the story of the Colossal and the Armors and only then introduces Eren. Which neatly brings us onto the title sequence, the response. Pretty blatantly hinting at the response of humanity now that they too have a titan on their side. And of course, with hindsight being 2020, we can also look at it from the point of view of the war between Marley and Paradis. Because while this may seem as a turning point in humanity's fight against the Titans, the following mission is also a very direct response to Marley. Reiner and Berthold blasted through the walls with the intention of luring out the Founder. But Aaron transforming and plugging the wall is Paradis' first ever proper response. And both the opening sequence as well as the title of the episode already paint that very well. Moving into the episode itself, we open moments before episode 9 concluded and Aaron hasn't popped his titan just yet. Instead, we once again look at the situation from a few different perspectives. First off, we see the paralyzing fear the soldiers are in, which in many ways just sets up the Trost recapture mission to follow in just a few more episodes. Especially lines like, our job is to keep fighting until we are devoured, just paint the soldiers as expendable, which would of course be a major throughline with the whole Aaron escort mission. And similarly, we very much see why keeping Aaron Stein confidential was the way to go, as even before hearing about the Titan, people are already on edge. Though the most interesting part once again comes from our other big trio, Reiner, Bertolt and Annie. Because as we see the lightning come down and Aaron's transformation kick in, Reiner's reaction isn't just shock that something happens. Rather, it's a confirmation that yes, Aaron did indeed just transform into a Titan. And very conveniently, Reiner is also the person we focus on the most as he is the first along with the rest of the Marley squad to zip off, with Jean only then beginning to follow them. Not to rehash everything we've talked about so far again, clearly confirming Aaron's transformation and his titan is a huge deal for Marley, and that is further complicated by this being an incomplete transformation, which from Reiner's point of view you could take to mean that Aaron was attacked and his titan might be in danger, something that Marley definitely wants to avoid. Keep in mind that if a titan shifter is not directly consumed by another titan, their power would simply be transferred to a completely random Eldian. Or, in other words, after five long years, they would have found at least one of the lost shifters, only to lose it in front of their eyes. Which is clearly a big no-no. Though returning to Aaron's squad, the first thing I want to note here is the music. The almost shaman-like chanting seriously reminded me of something like Dying Light. That eerie, slightly off tinge that comes from the almost ritualistic singing is so so good. Which is just further pronounced by them literally being surrounded by Aaron's titan bones. Which just makes this whole thing so so much spookier. And also, I forgot to mention the flowers last time but they're focused on a ton here. I don't think there's really a common consensus on what they symbolize but here's my two cents on it. The way I see it, there are three possible explanations to them. Number one is probably the most straightforward one, and that is that the purple color symbolizes royalty, grandeur, power, and status. The flowers often pop up around Aaron's transformations, so they may be a symbol of the power of the Titans themselves, which is of course further pronounced with Aaron specifically since he also has the Founder. Purely literally speaking, he might not have royal blood himself, but for all intents and purposes, when it comes to the Titans and the story as a whole, he is very much the chosen one and the one who'd ultimately free Ymir. Number two, and fair warning, I'm no florist, so this may be totally off base, but if you look at it more in depth, the flowers appear to be Campanula Medium. And yes, I have no idea how you pronounce the flower's actual name, I'm sorry. Based on what I found online, they are usually used to represent gratitude or faith and constancy. Which I think you could take to mean that the unity of Aaron, Mikasa and Armin can withstand anything and everything. When the military debated attacking Aaron, Mikasa stood her ground and Armin tried to talk the situation down and even with the cannons firing down on them, Aaron still pulls the reverse Uno and transforms into a titan protecting all of them. And I think this is supported by what Armin says about the flowers. 
wondering how even in this utter carnage they managed to survive, which you could take to mean that Aaron, even consciously not understanding his power, still managed to deflect all damage to the point that even something as delicate as flowers were left unscathed. And so, that is the faith they have in each other. They can withstand anything and everything. But number three, and after some digging, I honestly think this might be the strongest explanation. They represent the Founding Titan and the Paths. Again, they just so happen to pop up around Aaron during very important turning points in his story. Like in episode 1 where he woke up from his dream, which I think we've talked about ad nauseum already. Then here where his titan instincts are awoken and he subconsciously accesses the titan's memories. And then in season 2 as he literally activates the founding titan's power. Flowers are used a whole bunch in the series, everything from the nine petals signifying the nine titans, to these same flowers appearing after the death of Hans, to the hazy and dreary flowery field. So I do think that there is a number of different meanings you could infer here, especially with the clear cultural differences between me in Europe and Japan where the series was animated and written. But these three explanations are the ones that pop into my mind, as of right now at least. Oh, and also side notes, the dub here says the flowers weren't there before, implying that Aaron's transformation somehow grew them, but I honestly think this is just a mistranslation. Yeah, Ash is a fertilizer, but I fail to see any connection between Aaron suddenly sprouting flowers in a couple of seconds and the rest of the series. So yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is just a mistranslation. Though moving on, we get an absolutely amazing shot of Armin looking up at Aaron's carcass, which in my mind is very clearly evoking some sort of massive, very old building. Looking up, you can see the wear and tear of it, with it even creaking as some weathered old tower, which I think you could also take to be a parallel to the historical meaning of the Titans and their power. Because yeah, the Titans as a concept are obviously very, very old. But at this point in the story, we of course don't know that yet. So again, with the benefit of hindsight, I do like how this also hints at the far deeper history that we are yet to learn. And again, Aaron comes out of the Titan with no markings here and just like last time, this is still up in the air for me as to why exactly they're so inconsistent early on. Personally, I just write it off to an animation oversight and not much else. Though speaking of Aaron, it's here where even more of his memories are revealed. Specifically, saying that it is Grisha who turned him into this. Like I said last time, I think the way the whole mystery of the basement is slowly unraveled is just pure brilliance, and because I have the benefit of hindsight, I can also say that it clearly paid off. As we've talked about before, setting up these sorts of grand reveals is always a big, big gamble, especially the longer you drag the mystery on. Us viewers and readers have a tendency to build headcanons upon headcanons, which will inevitably leave many people disappointed. But with the basement reveal, as far as I've seen and heard at least, it is pretty commonly believed to be one of the greatest anime reveals of all time. And I wholeheartedly agree. But out of fear for rambling on for another hour, that's where I'll leave it for now. Just a very nice small hint toward the truths hiding within the basement. And speaking of which, it's also here where Aaron just straight up says that he'll leave on his own and head for the basement solo. But importantly, as he himself points out, he's not even sure how to transform into a titan yet, which would be a pretty major problem throughout the early parts of season 1. I think it's one of those things that are super easy to forget as we get further into the story, but Aaron does ultimately undergo a pretty rigorous training arc with his titan specifically, so the whole uncertainty around how he can even use his power is a pretty huge deal early on. And very fittingly, just like Aaron's state of mind, the piano in the background also has these flare-ups of anxious uncertainty. So again, just a brilliant piece of the OST. And also, also, there are a whole bunch of pretty amusing parallels between the Trost recapture mission and the final season, which I will occasionally mention. But note how Aaron here is all scuffed up with no gear and looks to be at his weakest. Only for him to say, I'll be moving solo from here on out. And then you skip to the final season where Aaron too is running around unkept with his hair loose with scuffed up clothes after a grueling fight. And there too, he very much goes solo as he activates the founder. Whether these are intentional or not, I at least find them pretty funny to see, especially with how drastically different the tone is between the two events. One being the very, very first mission, and the other clearly being the last. 
As for the mid-cards, they are pretty straightforward as they talk about the special kind of yeast that can only be found within Walsina. In hindsight, we of course know that this is mainly just some light world building, but way way back, there was a really fun theory people had about the Titans. Even Matt made a film theory video on it, so it's just fun to reminisce about the good old yeast theory. I won't go into it now for the sake of time, but if you've never heard about the yeast theory, there is plenty of stuff online that you can watch and read about it. Returning to the trio, we get this really cool perspective shot as Armin breaks down the situation. But what I love the most here is his inner dialogue as he remembers their childhood. And the line that tickles me the most is when he describes his fears about being left behind and how after all of this, the three of them will never be together again. And again, the fact that you can copy-paste this monologue to the final season really puts into perspective how these core character dynamics have never really changed. The moment Eren's final plans were set into motion, Armin knew full well that this is it. Their friendship more than likely ends here. We'll of course see how the final act of the story actually plays out in the next couple of months, but from where the story is headed right now, I do think that there are some very, very clear parallels here. And on top of that, because this is overanalyzing Attack on Titan, I have to bring up Armin's intelligence here. You remember how way back in high school or something, you made all of those promises about how you'd be friends forever and whatnot? Well, as I think many of you will know, next to none of those promises ever stand up to time. So Armin immediately realizing that this revelation about Aaron's Titan changes everything, just reinforces the fact that Armin does very much see the bigger picture. Not for a second does he think that their friendship will remain as is, because it won't. Aaron's Titan changes everything, both in the context of the story as well as their very personal relationships, and Armin immediately identifies it as such. And yes, I was that cynical old man back in school as well. When people around me were making all of these lifelong friendship promises, I knew all of them were silly. And yes, I was right 99% of the time. Though returning to the story, Aaron of course says that if Armin can talk everyone down, they can still try to do this by the book. And he then finally thanks Armin for calling Hans way back during that day in Shiganshina. We've talked about this bit of dialogue before from Mikas' perspective, so this just further reinforces that. Even as a small child, Armin knew that following his friends into this blind rush would get them nowhere. So he saw the bigger picture and actually went to get someone who can realistically do something. And while Hans did not save Aaron's mother, he definitely saved the rest of them. Though following all of that, Armin does very much step up and confront the military head on. Also, because I mentioned it last time, there is literally a list of Dutch angle shots in this one, all pointing to Armin's hectic state of mind here. So like I said last time, these are not by any means rare, and cinematography in general has always been a strong point of attack on Titan in my opinion. And speaking of which, the shots of Armin stepping out are also incredible. Notice how when he's standing with Aaron and Mikasa, we get all the shots from below, symbolizing how he has composed himself and is ready for the confrontation. The shot from below making him seem stronger and bigger. But as soon as he runs out, we immediately flip the perspective and pan around Armin from a distance, making him appear small as he is surrounded by the countless soldiers. And in terms of the dialogue, here too I think they absolutely hit the nail on the head. Armin essentially realizes that the perpetually terrified dude we've seen a whole bunch of already does not listen to reason. So the only thing he can realistically do is try to pull rank. He tries making it professional and trying to force him to play by the book. And on top of that, there's also the color theory angle here. Note how whenever we see Armin or hear his speech, it's all blue or green. Both of which are associated with calmness, stability, health and wisdom. Despite Armin screaming at the top of his lungs, all of this is a calculated play in direct response to the captain. Everything from dropping his ODM gear to pulling rank is a part of a well thought out pitch about Aaron. Whereas when we cut to the captain, everything is shades of red, symbolizing excitement, anger and all of those sorts of supercharged emotions. Unlike Armin, when he speaks there really is no thought process at all. It just feels like he's spouting out commands with little to no judgement behind them. And another thing that I find really interesting is how even at this moment when humanity potentially has a literal titan fighting on their side, birds in a cage still plays. Which I think goes to speak about just how hectic the situation is. Humanity is still yet to stand behind Aaron's titan and so nothing has changed just yet. 
they are all just birds in a cage. But then, the music is abruptly cut short as Pixis fades into the background and pulls the captain out of that emotionally charged and frankly reckless maneuver. And very fittingly for Pixis, as soon as he shows up, he immediately begins talking about the bigger picture as we fade right into a report narrated by Armin. As far as characterizing Pixis goes, I think right from the get-go they did an incredible job, and everything following this point just continues the trend of showing us his eccentricity and raw intelligence that we already saw back with the chess game. The fact that right away we hear of this report just solidifies that, unlike the terrified captain we just saw, Pixis looks at the entire board, if you will. And that is also visually showcased as, right away, we fade back into the presence and Pixis walks atop the wall calmly looking over the entirety of Trost, almost as if all of it was his chessboard and Aaron was the ultimate queen's gambit. And perhaps best of all is the scene immediately following this, as Pixis calmly asks Aaron's trio, So, all the answers are in the basement. Try to put yourself in his shoes. From his point of view, it's like, Oh, a magical basement with all the answers from a young kid who was just trying to save himself from being annihilated. Sure thing, right? But on the other hand, Aaron did just shift in and out of a titan twice now. So even if everything he said about the basement is entirely false, it's at least something to keep in mind. And that is exactly what he does. Instead of focusing on this supposed mystical basement, initially he is only concerned with the immediate and comparatively far more realistic play, patching up the wall. And very importantly, Note how he also says that he has the tendency to see truths in people. And keep this in mind for a minute. Following all that, he then turns to Armin to talk about his plan of plugging the wall using Garen's Titan. And one thing that I really enjoyed here is how Pixis does address what we just talked about. Explicitly asking whether this plea was just a moment of desperation where Armin just threw everything at the wall and see what stuck. Or did Armin genuinely believe in this plan? And Armin responds honestly, it was both. He just bluntly says, yeah, we were going to die, of course I played it up, but I do believe that there is a chance. I feel like a lot of series where we follow these younger, more inexperienced protagonists, they get way too caught up with making them the chosen ones and everything they do just ultimately turns out to be perfect. So Armin explicitly saying that he is still unsure about this whole thing was just a nice way to make this entire deal feel a little bit more real. And with that, for the first time ever, let us jump right into episode 11, which deals with the remainder of the Fallout. The opening sequence here is drastically different, as Armin's stand is entirely reframed as a gesture that likely saved humanity as we knew it back then. Everything from the music to how the scene is replayed to us, Armin changed the course of history, and with Pixa stepping in to save them, a new course for parody was set. As we've talked about many times, this is just another case of the series reframing past events through a new lens, which has always been a really strong point of the series in my opinion. And of course, much, much more on that in the future. As for the title of the episode, Idol. As far as this one goes, I honestly think you can swing it a couple of different ways. Number one would be that Aaron is the idol as he is the literal backbone of this entire mission. So while people's opinions on the whole human weapon deal might still be mixed, he is very much the idol. Though the second angle could be Pixis and his ability to see what others can't. As we just talked about, Pixis is someone who always looks at the bigger picture. And as we'd see throughout this mission, this very much pays off in droves. Everything from reigniting the passion within the people wanting to leave the military, to identifying this potential plan to begin with. And so, unlike the terrified captain who rules through fear, Pixis is a true idol. Though before we follow up with that, we briefly see another discussion between Aaron's trio where we get a very curious scene. They talk about the plan as a whole for a bit, but then Aaron drops the line, The Titans aren't our only enemies. Now, I am not totally crazy, obviously in the context of this episode, Aaron is referring to the military within parody and how many of them would be more than fine with killing Aaron before he becomes too much trouble. As we've talked about numerous times, everyone here believes that, for literal decades upon decades, Titans have done nothing but mindlessly slaughter them. So suddenly trying to use one for themselves, no matter how potentially useful, it is still a massive hurdle to overcome. But, because this is overanalyzing, 
Could Aaron be referring to something else? At this point in time, while he still doesn't understand the Titan, Grisha's memories have already guided him to activate it. The whole biting your hand to transform deal isn't actually as common as you might think, and most of the Marley squad uses different means unless there's an emergency. Whereas Aaron almost exclusively uses the hand biting technique, which we've distinctly seen somewhere else before, when his father got the founder. So at this point in time, I do think that, subconsciously, there may be a whole lot more going on in Aaron's mind that we are completely unaware of. And that is further strengthened by the fact that we are promptly cut off and the conversation ends there. And if you want even more evidence, remember how the owl casually name dropped Mikasa and Armin and then just said, I don't even know what I'm talking about. So, if Aaron were to suddenly remember Marley, for example, maybe he too is just like, yeah, I think the Titans are not our only enemies. And he might in fact be referring to them. Alright, returning to more sensible matters, we see that a substantial number of the soldiers think that this whole Trost Recapture mission is, for lack of a better word, just mind-boggling and many of them begin to talk about deserting the military outright. And almost right away, chaos begins to break out. And before we follow up with them, we circle back to Pixis and Aaron again, where we get another super interesting conversation. Pixis talks a bit about the history of parody and all that, but then says that, if something beyond man appeared before us as a powerful foe, mankind will take up arms in unity. Referring to how when it comes to life and death situations, people do tend to set their differences apart and ally up. However... Remember how Pixis was just described as seeing things others don't? Yeah, so I don't claim that this is some 9 million IQ foreshadowing, but I do find it interesting to see the deeper meaning here. Because it is just as Pixis said. The Titans were originally the force that humanity banded together against. Then, after learning of Marley and how they are in fact the ones pulling the strings, humanity shifted their scope to them. But finally, when Aaron became a foe not just more powerful than man, but more powerful than any Titan or military, literally the entire world, including all the other shifters and Marley who were just fighting against them, banded together to stop him. Not out of willingness to ally, but simply out of necessity. So I do think that this entire conversation taking place just between the two of them does neatly speak to the rest of the story, as well as solidifying Pixis as someone with very superior insight into the bigger picture of things. And also side notes, note how for almost all of these scenes, Pixis is walking atop the wall. Which again, I think is meant to mirror that whole chess master vibe with him that we've already seen. And as they're still walking atop the wall, they also run into hands where we get another scene that further changes our initial perceptions of him. Because as soon as he spots Aaron, his immediate thoughts are just about how their trio is safe and that's all he cares about. As we've talked about in episodes past, I do like these little occasional scenes we get of him that always remind us that ever since that day in Suganshina, he has very much changed his outlook on life and feels at least somewhat responsible for the trio. And of course, we see Pixis take a swig from his flask, which also gives us the obligatory young adult wanting to prove himself as a tough lad, taking a swig and immediately doing a spit take. So, that is also a nice bit of levity in this one. Though returning to more pressing matters, Pixis then addresses the soldiers directly. Of course, the whole cover-up of Aaron's Titan and trying to control the narrative continues here, where Pixis lies that Aaron is in fact a result of extensive research into the Titans, and not just some random fluke of nature. Though in tandem, we cut to Armin who too is drawing up battle plans, notably wanting to simply kite the Titans away instead of fighting them head on. And more on this in a second, but what I find really interesting here is how he is still clearly the junior here. It's a very very small detail I do admit, but many stories would opt to instantly give him some high rank for what we're about to see. But that's not what happens here, with him even being skittish about talking up to what are technically his superiors. Again, just a nice bit of realism where Armin isn't just shot up the ranks because he is the chosen one. But probably my favorite detail is that this plan too is essentially one big gamble. On the face of it, kiting the Titans away instead of fighting them is obviously just a smart move, right? But Armin also thinks that going in super light is also the best move. 
Instead of sending an entire army, they just send in a small elite squad to escort Aaron. Which is smart and all, but if things go south, it is just a small elite squad, right? The whole planning nature of Armin is a detail that's easy to overlook, I think. But I do really like that most of his plans are indeed these sorts of gambles. Though, returning to Pixis, we see that even after hearing of Aaron's ability, fearing for their lives as expendable pawns in this grand plan to escort Aaron, lots of soldiers simply want to leave. And it's then that we are once again reminded of the big picture. While the petrified captain wants to rule through fear, straight up threatening to kill them, Pixis says that he'll pardon all of them. From his point of view, people who have already surrendered to fear are of no use. Trying to push people who don't want to fight into battle will result in nothing more but pointless bloodsheds. So to bolster the spirits of those who remain, Pixis is kind and he is empathetic, allowing anyone and everyone to leave if they wish, but reminding them that if this plan fails, the Titans will not be the end of them. It will be humans themselves who tear each other apart for basic necessities. And to remind us of these two pillars of this mission, we get another absolutely incredible shot, as Pixis and Aaron are almost standing above the rest of humanity. As for the mid-cards, these are once again pretty straightforward, describing movement with the ODM gear. Though, we'll talk about ODM gear plenty more in just a second, so hold that thought. As for the story, here we see the Elite Squad assembled, though before it's sent off, Mikasa is added on personally by Ian. Clearly, he can see that with someone like Mikasa, they have a far, far better chance of success. And he also more than likely expects her to show up anyway, so just getting her on board formally is just a smart move. And also, that brief scene of Mikasa just smiling is super wholesome. But then, those drums of war and battle chants kick in once again as the mission to recapture Trost begins in full swing. But one last thing to mention here is the super brief conversation we have with Aaron and the others, where he is reminded that each and every soldier who will lose their lives today has just as detailed and intricate of a life as he does. I'll bring this up at every opportunity because it's both fascinating and terrifying at the same time, and there's even a word for it. But yes, the next time you walk on the streets, look around and remember that each and every person around you has just as complex of a life as you do. All of your weird habits and secrets, they have those too. I don't know about you, but I find that super interesting to think about, so I like that it was also briefly mentioned here, even if it was a mostly throwaway line. As for the last minutes of the episode, yet again, re-watching this seriously reminded me of just how many of these season 1 moments I'd forgotten. Because this ODM gear sequence is just stupidly good. Like seriously, if you wanted to get me hyped for the upcoming mission, you outdid yourself by a couple of orders of magnitude. I would love to play this whole thing for you here, but I obviously can't for copyright reasons, but sheesh. The wall running, the ground slides, the rooftop jumps, the wall jumps. The sequence is just something else entirely. And the way CG is leveraged here is also the perfect example of doing things that would otherwise be nigh impossible. Because yes, basically only the character is hand drawn here, everything else is CG. And the electrical, almost distortion-based music here just makes all of that so, so much better. So yes, this is one of many ODM gear sequences in the series that we just straight up do not deserve. Though in story, we see another detail that might be overlooked. The fact that Aaron once again knows exactly what to do. He flies around, and without giving it a second thought, immediately chomps down on his hands. So again, makes you wonder what memories he's already seen at this point. And yes, the animation here of his roar is excellent as usual. But because this is Attack on Titan, clearly things are not all sunshine and rainbows. Because the triumphant music abruptly turns to silence. And the second Mikasa begins to question what's happening, Eren is already throwing a punch directly at her. We'll deal with the fallout of all this in the next episode, but again, with how used to the whole Titan shenanigans we've gotten by now, it's important to remember that Aaron's first transformations weren't exactly perfect yet. So this is just another example of him having very little idea of what he's even doing right now. Though yes, this punch will have some pretty important implications which we'll get to next time. And that is where we'll call it for today. 
Finally, our first double episode as these two just flowed very neatly into each other and were pretty setup heavy. Something tells me the next couple will once again be standalone ones, but unfortunately I don't have the Attack Titan, so only time will tell. And with that, I hope to see you next time as we delve headfirst into the Trost Recapture mission and continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. A very setup oriented one, but still a really fun one. And because this is Attack on Titan, obviously next episode will be right back into the thick of it. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. And let's also give a warm welcome to the newest members of the team, Goose Boy, Juzism World, Alex Navarro, and Alex Rodriguez. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.